by sea and land, is the motto of the Royal Corps of Marines. Answer your names. Corporal Gallagher. Sir. Corporal Sawyer. Sir. Marines Ward. Sir. Bowers. Sir. Laws. Sir. Richardson. Sir. Jackson. Sir. Halliday. Sir. Amongst the hosts assembled for the liberation of France were the Royal Marines, the Navy's soldiers. On D-Day, with the Army's commandos, they smashed their way ashore past the Atlantic Wall. Here, on D plus 19, is a party of reinforcements going up to fill the gaps in the ranks of fallen comrades. There it is, the coast of Normandy, the mirage which has been before us all during four years of training and preparation. No mirage now, reality at last, France. French sand, French seas, French skies. It's strange being ashore, not a bit what one expects. Already only a fortnight after D-Day, everything looks as if it had been here for months. Even the German strong points have a prehistoric look about them. Always alongside and behind us, the Navy, to bring men and supplies and to safeguard the routes. On top of this, the Navy has another job, to organize all that passes between the land and the sea. Continuous traffic moves between the ships and the land. Men busy doing two different sorts of jobs. Ashore one moment, afloat the next. Boats and ducks run in and out to fetch supplies. Boats, barges, ducks, the movement never ceases. Combined operations isn't just romantic piracy. It's hard work as well. Each man must be two people. A sailor afloat, a soldier ashore. A bottleneck in supplies can lose a battle, so the beaches must be kept clear. Five days of gale has piled up wreckage worse than the original D-Day damage, and to clear it is part of the sailor's job. Salvaging wrecks, patching up landing craft, draining and refloating lighters, plugging, boring, welding. They sweat away to get the stuff off the beach and back into the sea. The way to the front line lies across the Caen Canal by the Pegasus Bridge, named after the airborne troops who took it, and into the range of the enemy guns. Up to the ridge, past the abandoned wrecks of the gliders, still lying like wounded butterflies, exactly where they'd come down. Then, towards evening, we reach our new positions. These men are the original marine commandos who went ashore on D-Day. They'd stormed the beach defenses and fought their way inland. Now their job was to lock tight the British extreme left flank whilst the main offensive develops in the center. They've held this position almost by sheer personality, without strong artillery or tank support, simply by constant worrying tactics. Behind them and out to sea to their left, are the guns of the Navy. Night and day, men go out in small, tough patrols, sniping the enemy, harassing him, and generally creating alarm and despondency. Here in this little French wood, they are only 300 yards from the enemy. And all it looks like is a camping holiday at the bottom of the garden, back home.
That evening, the new party see their first Germans, dead ones. A couple of hundred yards away, some of the boys are working up an appetite. Whilst across the valley, the guns are playing a different game. But neither the football nor the guns disturb the French peasant. If one has a cow, it has to be milked. Then our men go back to their supper. Tinned hash and biscuits, compote tea and mosquitoes. Now then, heads well back and throw your arms well out. Like this. Out, back. Now then, after me. One, two, one, two. One, two, one, two, one, two, out, back, come on, out, back, out, back, out, back, one, two, one, two. At headquarters, the day's routine is settled. Down at the sea, beyond the mass of supply ships, a destroyer is moving up into position. At the edge of this little wood is a house our observation post. Inside it are two sailors, telegraphists, in touch with the destroyer by wireless. And up under the battered roof is the forward observation officer. That destroyer is in his pocket. He directs its fire. The target this morning is an enemy strong point. The mound under the tree is just to the left of that little house. The Navy will shell it to keep the defenders' heads down while the Marines approach. As soon as the shell fire lifts, they will go in to kill, snatch a prisoner for questioning, and get away. Made up like Red Indians, the patrol moves on. Between our lines and the enemy, there is little life. Houses are deserted, hamlets abandoned. As you go into them, you get a curious, eerie sensation. As you move along the streets, you keep on feeling you're being watched. Behind those windows may be a sniper's rifle. Those who shoot first live. You've got to keep your wits about you on this sort of job. You've got to be quiet, cautious, alert. Sometimes the Germans have the same idea and send a patrol out too, so it's important to spot them first. The Marines crawl forward as far as possible and take cover, waiting for the Navy to open up. They don't have to wait long. Guns ready. Ready to observe. Away. Up. 
200, up 200, up 200, up 200. Away. Shelling stops. The strong point has been neutralized. Now it's the patrol's turn. A German jumps up out of his slit trench and runs along the hedge. Just what they've been waiting for. Every German they take is one payment off the score. And the score is a pretty heavy one. We lost good men coming ashore on D-Day. Men we knew and liked. Men we shan't forget. So, day by day, these Marines are doing their job. The trivial daily round of the fighting man. As they have done it a thousand ways since D-Day. By sea and land. By sea and land. Our thoughts are reaching back over the sea to England. Our hopes are reaching forward into the land of France, towards Europe. Forward into free France. Forward into free Europe. 